to align your sales message, management, and metrics to drive revenue results. A couple of things before we get started. Um, we appreciate you joining us today, but we know you're busy. We'll be respectful of your time and make sure we finish up in less than an hour. We encourage your questions. There's a question link at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to ask questions as you have them. And if we can't get to all of your questions live, we'll make sure that we follow up with you directly after the webinar. And then lastly, we'll be sharing a recorded version of our presentation today along with the slide deck and a follow-up email. So make sure to look for that tomorrow. Joining us today is uh, Grant Wilson and Mark Silberstrom. Grant is the managing partner at Force Management. He's got over 25 years experience in really driving sales performance. At Force Management, he's worked with lots of businesses from startup, SMB, through to the Fortune 100. Before Force Management, he was selling and management, managing at companies like PTC and HP. Mark is VP of Worldwide Sales at Clary. Previously, he helped drive a 300 year-over-year -year growth rate at Sprinkler, scaling from 50 to 1,200 employees. Before he was at Sprinkler, he held sales leadership roles at Collective Intellect, which was acquired by Oracle, and an IBM company, Sterling Commerce. Both of these guys have great experience leading sales organization and a lot of insight around critical alignment areas. So Grant, let's start with you. Sometimes the most important part of a sales organization, those things that make a sales organization really able to accelerate growth have to do with the processes that are behind the deal. No doubt, Kim. Often when we work with sales organizations, and I know Mark's been through this himself, it's those processes and tools behind the scenes that can actually help us ensure some of the sales performance lift up what we're doing, drive consistency, and ultimate drive scale. What we're, what we're gonna talk about today, there's three major points. The first one will be about how do we make sure that our sales organization is aligned behind and with this business strategy, and how does that manifest itself at the point of sale when they're actually selling and talking with the buyer? Number two is how do you ensure your sellers are focused on the highest value selling activities and then how do we work with them to make sure that they're focused on those and reinforce those activities? And then finally, how do we make sure we're set up with our processes and tools in a way that makes it easy for the sellers to execute? Mark, I know Clary has a great point of view on this. Do you mind uh, providing us and level setting us on how this applies up and down and across the sales organization? Absolutely, Grant, and, and thanks so much for uh, having me join today. I'm looking forward to a really great session. Uh, so, essentially some background on we, why we focused on those three takeaways today. Um, it, Clary, we went and surveyed 300 uh, reps, managers, executives, and ops folks with an objective of getting really the, the, the handle on the key challenges that are facing our sales organizations during what we call an opportunity to close process. And th there was findings that we found really interesting. And the first is that, you know, 38% of reps say they're not spending time on the right opportunities. And 14% of the respondents said that having over 70%, they, they, they only have 14% of reps hitting over, uh, or 70, 14% of uh, the organization said 70% or more of their reps are hitting quota in 2016. So it, it seems that sales reps are spinning their wheels on the wrong opportunities. And that'll shed light on why so few of them are actually making quota. And furthermore, if we look at this, 70% look beyond, of managers look beyond CRM to identify deal risk. So we know that that typically are one-on-ones, uh, folks are left to their own devices. And an interesting fact that we'll, we'll go through here today is that, you know, personally at Clary, I've taken you know, one-on-ones down from what were typically 90, up to 90 minute sessions to 15 minutes. And it really comes down to sales managers are hungering to get a better handle on the health of the pipeline. And only one fifth of our respondents found their one-on-one -on -one meetings today an effective process. 
Kim, if you want to keep moving on. So as part of that, nearly half say calling the number is their biggest challenge. And only 7% of leadership is forecasting with five, within 5% five of their actual achievement. Okay, so we know that we've got a sales execution problem. And if we think about what we hear in the market, whether you're a rep, you're a manager, or you're an exec, you have a forecasting problem as, as an executive or a manager. Managers and execs have rep productivity problems. They have CRM data problems. And they have pipeline visibility problems. And we all know, for to a certain degree, we rely on our system of record. And whether that's Salesforce or Dynamics or any other system of record, we all know that reps want to go out and sell. And they're going to put the minimal amount they need to in order to be left alone to go sell. And when they do that, that leaves management and executives in a quandary because we're analyzing limited data when we go to understand risk in our pipeline and ultimately in our forecast. And if we keep moving on, we have a way that we're looking at this today to solve this problem that's existed for personally the 20 plus years I've been doing this. I know Grant, we've spoken the 25 plus years you've been doing this. And that's because we're working in silos. And what we're calling opportunity to close it is a unique time and market where we have an ability to work collaboratively in a single environment. And what that encompasses is forecast management, opportunity management, and pipeline inspection. And if we double click to find out what's really happening in a sales org, some of these examples should really sound familiar. So reps spending time chasing opportunities that don't close. In other words, they have happy ears. The deals seem to look good, but is it really following that process, rigor, and methodology your organization employs to increase confidence and success? The ripple down effects is managers are spending a ton of their time chasing reps to get a handle of what's really going to close. Back to one-on-ones. They shouldn't be sessions on rehashing what's occurred. They should be coaching sessions with the rep. And finally, executives then have less confidence in their forecast and struggle to get a, their arms around what's the real risk in the forecast number that's being called. But opportunity to close is, and it's not a standalone process in a vacuum. Next slide. It's really part of what we call an end-to-end -end sales motion. So let me frame this and kind of where this, what we call OTC or opportunity to close resides in the end-to-end -end sales motion. So if we think about the 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 end to end sales motion and we look on the left hand side lead to opportunity is really a, a we can almost call it a mainstream um part of the the end to end process where you've got players that were like the the marketos or the oracle um uh eloqua folks that are sitting on top of of the system of record and on the other end of the spectrum you've got QTC or CPQ where you've got the big machines, the steel bricks, the aptus of the world. But ironically, nobody's really addressed what we live in in the sales world, which is opportunity to close. We've been left to our own devices to in a fragmented environment to put all of that together to call a number. And the purpose in life and the purpose of, of, of what we do every day at Clary is we look to solve this opportunity to close gap. Next slide. So what does that mean? Let's talk about what's happening through the eyes of the folks in, in the typical sales organization. First, let's talk from the rep perspective. We know CRM pl pl platforms are forcing reps to do way too much manual entry. How many times do you hear, I'll get to it when I get on the airplane, or I'll spend time tonight after dinner. But what that leads to is reps aren't entering enough data. Again, I'm gonna, I'll say it one more time, reps do what they need to in order to be left alone so they can get out and sell. And what this does is when you get to the managers, they have very little visibility into what's really happening in a deal and the actual activity. 
unless they're riding side by side with a rep on a regular nonstop basis, they really don't know how engaged the customers are. So what's this lead to? At least a lot of end of quarter surprises. We all know this, deals slipping and deals lost. But it doesn't stop there. It moves into the executive suite. And that's where we talk about the forecasting process, where when you have managers that are a bit blind based on the calls they're making on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, based on what they heard from the rep and what the rep wanted them to hear, we get accuracy concerns. And that's especially true when you can't isolate the source of where the risk is, exists. So ultimately, the forecast is missed. And then finally, the ops team is constantly scrambling to create reports and fix all of this, but they've also been left to their own devices because they're, they're in a situation where they have only point-based solutions available that don't allow them to see the true end-to-end -end opportunity to close ecosystem, and it misses the mark. So Grant, I know we, we've chatted a little bit about this in, in, in prior discussions, and we even had a chat earlier this morning. We know that now that technology has enabled a unified end-to-end -end ecosystem from a rep to exec, there still has to be a common language. And we know that, that you know, including the process and tools that ensure alignment for the entire organization, it's a critical function. And it all begins with truly understanding the strategy at the point of sale. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. Thanks, Mark. So when you when you think about what we're trying to do, right? It's and you're you're trying to focus on how are we going to execute. Uh, Mark just kind of went through, you know, how do we get that process nailed down? What's that opportunity to close look like, and how does the rest of it come together? At the end of the day, how that comes together will back way up into um, what are we actually going to do from a business strategy perspective. And so when we understand what that is, how do we align that business behind it so that we can be effective at the point of sale? This all begins with the buyer, right? The buyer really comes uh, out in front of any strategy that we have or any processes or tools that we put in place to be effective as sellers. So when you think about it, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to figure out how that buyer makes a buying decision and how do we draft into that buying decision and influence it in our favor? So as we move through that process, there's two things we gotta stay really focused on. How do we create and capture value for that buyer during the process of going through that? And then ultimately, how are we engaging them? And how do we actually know if we're, we're, we're driving interest with that buyer? Because um, if we don't get it right for the buyer, nothing else really matters. So uh, as, as we go through this, um, let's talk a little bit first. There's two things we'll talk about. One is what's that conversation look like? And two, how do we get that mapped into their process? It comes down to this. How are we prepared to have great buyer conversations as an organization, right? And this is really important. It's beyond sales. It's beyond marketing. It's beyond the SDRs who are or setting or taking inbounds or, or driving outbound. But it, and it sounds like a simple question. Are we ready to have a buyer conversation? But on the execution side, this is tough. And it requires the whole organization to think about what that looks like from leadership to marketing, to product development, to services, all need to be unified. Let's go through just a real quick exercise uh, today as we sit here. Let's go to the next slide here. If you think about sitting in a room with your executive team, your a cross-functional departmental uh, meeting, a sales meeting, and everybody took out a piece of paper and independently answered these questions, how unified would our answers be within our company? And we'll talk about why this is important in a moment. But let's think through these for just a moment. And whether you wanna write these down now, we're also gonna send this content out later. But when you think about that first one, what problems do you solve for your customers? And when we think through that, what business problems do we solve for our customers? Are we solving a business problem or are we solving a very low level technical problem or some other low level problem? But no matter what we're doing, how do we attach, how do we understand what that problem is and 
how do, do we know we can solve it? And how do we attach ourselves to the biggest problem in that company that we can lay claim to? So the first question is, how do we, what problems do we currently solve for our customers and keep that to the business level? Second is, how do we specifically solve these problems? And this isn't just the solution. This isn't just the service. This isn't just the support afterward. It's the whole thing. How do you go through that entire process to understand that problem, to meet that problem where it exists, and to really drive out explicitly how you're going to solve that for the customer? What plan do you have for them to be successful in their initiative or to be successful in solving that problem? Then your third one is, how do you do it differently or better than the alternative? We have up here the competition because that's typically who we're battling against. But sometimes when you get into some of the, the IT sectors, you're also uh, battling against homegrown or do it yourself. So how do you specifically and explicitly do it differently than competition or uh, the alternative that they have to solving this problem with you? And then finally, what proof do you have? And, and proof, is a, proof is a funny thing, right? It's, it's, uh, you, you can probably always find people that say good things about you, but do you have explicit proof, measurable proof where you change the business outcome? What were those measures? What did they look like? And will your customer lay claim to that and say that that actually took place? So this portion is, are we aligned behind these things? What problems do we solve? How do we specifically do it? Why are we different or better? And what proof do we have? Now, once we've got good alignment across the company, let's talk about why that's important. Why does this matter? So if we take a look at what's going on in a typical customer or buyer life cycle, and I'll use those phrases interchangeably, but when you look at what's going on there, they typically, there's some kind of compelling event or awareness that a problem needs to be solved or awareness of an initiative that's going to help drive growth or something else within their business. Then they move into, okay, we've identified what that is. We're going to move into that buying process. We're going to evaluate our options. We're going to make some decisions. And then we're going to spend a lot of time focused on making sure we're successful, that we made the right decision, that we did the right piece. And so we're going to put a ton of energy behind that. When we think about what we're doing as a company, when we, when we run into these customers or run into this buying life cycle, we're trying to engage them at different levels here, right? Our first level is typically around that lead gen piece, whether that's digital engagement, whether that's uh, inbound, outbound, whatever that happens to be, we're trying to engage at that lead gen place so we can participate in that research they do during that awareness phase. So that when they go to find people who help with those initiatives and problems, they, they seek us out. Then we want to move into that buying process. And again, we want to understand how that buyer makes a decision so that we can draft into it and influence in our favor. And then ultimately, we want to ensure their success, make sure that it comes together well. When we do this as a business, we have a lot of people in our company that have interactions with those customers. Yeah, it tends to start out in the marketing phase if we're all beginning at the, at, the, at the top of it. We're moving into business development. We move into the sales aspect, engineers, professional services, and so on. But what happens is it, it's, it gets to be difficult to drive a consistent experience, an impactful experience for that buyer unless we're all aligned around problems we solve, how we do it, why we're better or different than the competition, and what those proof points look like. So when you think about that, there's a lot of touch points and handoffs that occur here. So if we were to unfold this circle and lay it out flat, uh, even though it's a cyclical process, if we were to look at it this way, you know, there's an awful lot of handoffs that occur as we go through engaging our customers. There's things going on with marketing and the business development folks, there's handoffs that could go directly out to the field or might go to inside sales, pre-sales solution art architects or in sales engineers get involved. You've got professional services and so on. I won't go through all these. And I'm sure your models look slightly different than this or different uh, in, in different ways. But the point here is this. There's a lot of information handoffs that occur and that take place. And if we are truly going to provide the customer with a consistent experience 
that they, they understand exactly what we do, how we drive that value, it will, it will also uh, drive more engagement from them. They will begin to engage more with us because we've been consistent, we've had the same message of value, we've articulated how we're going to help them drive that value and capture that. So these handoffs matter as we start to put that process and framework together. This gets even further, uh, it's even a further requirement if you have partners or channel partners or alliance partners that you work with, because in addition to what you manage internally from a handoff perspective and driving that consistent experience, you need to bring those other partners in as well. Great guys, that was, you've covered a lot of great insight here and um, really helped kind of set the tone around that first key point. So just to review, alignment of your business strategy and your sales organization requires really three key things. Number one, a process that enables you to effectively create and capture value along that entire customer engagement process cross-functional alignment around your value and differentiation and what that means to the buyer. And then lastly, getting every member of your sales organization, making sure they have visibility into that critical opportunity to close process. Um, Mark, before we move on, do you have any final thoughts about that visibility and alignment on that last point, the opportunity to close process? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I love this and that, you know, you get the team aligned across all three of those areas and it's critical that you have them all working in a, in a unified operating rhythm and ecosystem with the same level of information. And as I mentioned from the beginning, from our survey results, it's clear that the teams are ultimately spinning their wheels. Reps are chasing deals that don't close. Managers are chasing reps to get a handle on what's going to close and execs are chasing their managers to get a handle on the risk to the forecast. But imagine a unified environment that's now possible through technology that allows us to insert this process that Grant was talking about and allow us to get reps excited about working in that environment. Imagine if reps could get predictive insights about their deals. Deal scores representing a likelihood to close. Um, nudges from a bot about deals that are falling out of the guardrails or need to be up, up, updated. Um, risking deals, promising deals, stagnant deals, ultimately allowing them to know where to focus. And most importantly, that the reps see the value in that ecosystem, that they become addicted to using it. And this truly is a Trojan horse to better data and symbiotic to everyone on the team because now managers are able to inspect the pipeline, understand where the deals stand, where there's risk, where there's upside, and the managers now become coaches. And it allows them to get focused on the right opportunities with their team and align to the process that, that Grant was speaking to and ultimately the business goals. And it becomes a proactive coaching and mentoring relationship as opposed to a reactive 11th hour scramble to fix the crisis. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Just uh, I've got uh, 16 business days left in my quarter. And we had a rep that, that plowed a deal out to the end of next quarter and we were able to see what was really happening in that deal and not only move it back into the quarter but we actually got it closed last month and we know that as executives if we know where there's risk and what the source of the risk is we can confidently get back to the team get them on track become their coach and at the end game for us is we have confidence in our forecast That's great, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to get, Grant, I know we work together and I know you're very maniacal about ensuring the reps have time to sell. And in just what we've talked about so far today, it sounds like there's a lot of potential time wasted and administrative burdens that can obviously take time away from actually selling. So our second key point we really wanted to talk about is, is this. Um, as a sales leader, how do you ensure your reps and managers are really focused on those high value selling activities? Well, I think if we back up a little bit and we think about what we're trying to accomplish, right? It's if, if we are aligned as a business, we know what we do, we know how we drive real value for our customers. And, and we're all clear on what that is. 
and we've got an opportunity to really have well, uh, good definition around how we hand things off. That should, for everyone in the company, eliminate some of the overlap. Oftentimes, as a manager, we end up doing other things that go outside of our, go outside of what we do every day because we we feel like we're helping the process or, or whatever. Whether I'm a sales manager or a product manager, whatever I happen to be. So I think that alignment, first of all, will allow our allow all of us to, to focus on what we do. From a sales manager perspective, it's what do I really want to be able to accomplish? Uh, and what am I, if, I, if I'm the VP of sales, what do I want that frontline group to really stay focused on and to be prescriptive around? And there's probably three things that we typically see all the time. First one is probably why they were hired or promoted into the job. And that's to drive real uh, sales execution. What does that look like? What are we asking them to do? Have we really figured out what the formula is within our company to help them be successful? And how do they drive that with their group and with their team? The second thing is I want them to be really great at, at working with their team, lifting their team up, helping them uh, be more successful, building that team out, turning, uh, bringing people into the company and helping them turn them into stars inside the company. And then finally, line of sight. Line of sight, uh, the way we think about it is it's actually two way. It's line of sight between does my team as a frontline manager understand their contribution and impact on the company? Do they know that their job matters? That what they do is very important to the business and they know how it, it ties into that business strategy. And then as the executive team, do they have visibility into what that frontline group's really doing? And what are they, what are they, uh, are they doing to really drive it? So let's think a little bit about what a management operating rhythm looks like in, and I'll give you some examples. So specifically, there's the three things we talked about. It's sales planning and execution, it's the talent side, and then it's corporate visibility. In each one of these areas, what we're, what we're really trying to do is to figure out what are the rules of thumb and the guiding principles for people to be successful at my company? What does that look like? So for ex I'm going to use a real simple example. If we do account planning and account reviews, which we should, right? How often do we do them? What's the frequency? What are the milestones? Is it, is it daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly? Or is it a milestone in the company itself inside that account that, that forces a, an account review? What is it and what's the frequency we're doing? And then how often do we do it? Do we do it for every single account that we have? Do we do it for accounts of only a certain size? Do we only do it for new ones that we're not uh, into yet? Or do we do it for existing or both? So it's what are those guidelines we want to have executed here at our company? What do those look like? What tools are we going to use? Is it, is it our CRM system? Is it, is it CRM plus some other things? Is it a separate account plan? What is it we're going to use? And then what does success look like? To go through any of these exercises, whether it's account planning, opportunity reviews, whatever that happens to be, what does success actually look like? Is it growth within an existing account? Is it the site? Is it the new logo? Is it the uh, being able to sell multiple products within multiple divisions of a company that we're going after? What does success actually look like? So when you think about an operating cadence for that frontline team, and, and while it may sound a little draconian, like, hey, here's your, here's your cookbook on everything you're going to do, it also keeps in there, it focuses in on the priorities and removes the things you don't want them to do. So for all, for all those things they had to do anyway, it also gets rid of all the, uh, all the stuff that you want off their, off their plate. So they're only focused on the critical few, whether it's around sales execution, talent might be, how often do they have coaching sessions? Or how often do they do sales enablement within their own team themselves, right? And then corporate visibility, what does that look like? What does a QBR look like and so forth? So those, those tend to be, right, how that framework comes together. And again, it's about prioritization, being prescriptive on those activities, and not about piling on tasks. So, Mark, I know you focus this a lot, focus on this a lot at Clary. 
can you talk a little bit about um, what you feel like the key to driving that focus is and maybe what you've seen some great companies do to ensure that kind of uh, cadence and achieving that predictable revenue? That's right. And, and really, at the end of the day, you know, we want to make sure our, our team is spending their selling time on the right opportunities. And now that the technology has made it available, we can start to leverage artificial intelligence and predictive insights and really build a competitive advantage. And this is where you're able to look back at data, historical wins and losses, and, and leverage these advanced algorithms and data science to be part of winning teams and to have some fun out there in the field. And you know, another example is in doing so, once you get the reps are, are living in, in this unified environment and they know that they're in a positive coaching environment, they're really open to, uh, to that coaching. And, and I'll use an example is my job as an executive is to tease out that risk in the forecast. And you know, I looked at my forecast a couple of weeks ago and I realized I had the, our artificial intelligence had called out one committed deal that was really at risk. And I double clicked on that and I realized that we missed a part of the process that Grant has, has laid out for us today. And I was able to go back, not just to the, the area vice president, but the rep as well, and call that out in course correct with plenty of time left in the quarter, as opposed to me finding this out at the 11th hour, having a rep and a, and a VP ask, hey, wave the magic wand and fix this. And we were able to get this deal back on track. But the reality is we need those processes and those processes have to be cohesive. They have to be vetted and they have to be in a, in a really tight operating rhythm. And when you layer on the, the technology of opportunity to close, we ensure that uh, you know, we have a successful environment. But perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Kim, do you, wanna, do you wanna move on here? Yeah, I think that segues great into our final point. And it, it sounds like it's simple in some cases, but we know that many times we implement processes and tools and we think they're easy for our reps to execute, but they may actually fail miserably. So the last key point we wanted to talk about today is, you know, how do you take a step back in your sales organization and take a good look at those processes and tools and, and make sure that they're set up in a way that your sellers can really execute well and execute efficiently. So Mark, do you have thoughts on that? I do, in fact, you know, in my, my years of experience, you know, not just leading teams in, in, in the executive role, but as a rep, it's so clear those tools and processes must be aligned. You know, the user experience and adoption are just so critical. And I think we've all been a part of having shiny, uh, shiny new objects rolled out to us as well as rolled them out to teams. But there's a few keys to success here. And the first is, you know, if you, if you put yourself in a rep's shoes, you know, what's in it for them? And, you know, is there value? Is it gonna give them time back to sell? Can they better manage their opportunities? Do they move to a more constructive coaching-like environment with their leaders and it's team-oriented and not, you know, interrogations on one-on-ones where really it becomes a cohesive team. But ultimately you need to have a user experience. And I always say kindergarten it, it must be easy. And that needs to exist not just on, on you know, uh, their desktop or laptop, but that needs to be mobile IM channels. It truly needs to be a unified ecosystem that incorporates the process and the methodology and it's tightly integrated into the operating rhythm to, to really net out with what we're talking about here, which is opportunity to close. And that's really what we see as core of, you know, of the successful sales organizations we work with. We work with you know, over 150 and we see that when this really hits on all cylinders, it's wildly successful. So back to you, Kim. Yeah, it, it sounds like the integration of both the sales methodology and the way we execute with our sales process and tools is really what, what's at the core of what you're seeing 
in successful sales organizations, which is a framework and really a systematic approach to kind of help sales leaders drive that message and increase visibility into the pipeline and into their day-to-day -day selling motion. Um, Grant, is there anything you would add here? Just thoughts on this last piece? Yeah, I think that, you know, let's move on here. I think the piece is we owe it to the sellers to give them every single opportunity to be successful. And we owe it to our companies to help them do that. Um, we talked about how do we make sure they're executing the business strategy at the point of sale. Uh, that really goes back to what's going on for our buyers. How well are we aligned around what we say and how we say it and what the conversation is going to be and why we're different or better. Right. And then what's that buying life cycle in our industries that we can draft into an influence in our favor. The second thing we really talked about is how do we make sure they focus on those highest uh, activities. And that was really around what's the manager's focus. What's that frontline manager. We've talked before and we've all heard it that that frontline manager is the hardest job can be the hardest sales job in the company. And how do we help be more prescriptive and help them be successful. And, and, and helping uh, their team's performance. And then finally, what's that ability to understand the engagement, to be able to have the right tools in place so that I can be prescriptive and proactive to what's not necessarily uh, what we would see without those tools so that we can help the sales be successful and ultimately predict revenue and help help the company overall. Okay, Th thanks Grant. And Mark and Grant, uh, your perspective on this has been really good. Um, I know we talked about these th three key areas and it sounds like if we address those areas, we're really enabling our sellers to do their best work every day. And it really gives them the opportunity to experience everything that comes with that, which is um, repeatable and agile revenue growth, as well as alignment um, and, and coaching and success for those sellers. Um, so thanks for your input.